You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have uh, the two members of the Virginia Trophy Guides uh, service, separate from the title, uh, on the show today. Uh, this was actually a really cool deal. Austin reached out to me. I think he saw the Alabama Bass Invasion uh, episode that I did with the guys down at the DWR, Virginia DWR, and we got to talking a little bit, and I guess everything worked out for tonight. So, you know, Austin, thank you so much for putting this together. Josh, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Excited to be here. Um, you know, when we start, when I started this show, it was just bringing education and awareness to like all the cool opportunities that, that are in Virginia and the greater DMV area. And it's not just the big curves and the Smith Mountain Lakes. It's that we have an amazing musky history story too, with really the new, when I was flipping through magazines of like, oh, this was the hot deal back in the day before the James became like the really, you know, really hot looking new girlfriend and the new became like the ex-wife or whatever. But then also we have some of the best smallmouth rivers too, where you could do the new, the upper James, the Rappahannock, Shenandoah, upper Potomac, then the, then the Susquehanna. Like it's insane how much cool river water we have here. And the river everyone's been wanting to, to know more about is this, this thing that's on the ass end of the world, which is the new river that even the guys at the DWR said like, yeah, like, Compared to Richmond, it's like Mars. It's so far out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see where some people in the state could think that. Um, you know, when you live here, it's it's practically in your backyard as a Roanoke native and occupant. Um, I, you know, it, it seems funny to hear somebody say that because it's just such, uh, you know, it's just so commonplace for us here. I, I don't know. I, you, you kind of... Uh, it's a world-class fishery or it can be on the right day. So, you know, you think its reputation would uh, travel a little further. And uh, part of me is glad that it hasn't. And part of me, you know, um, looks forward to the future of, you know, the new river and, you know, the fishery that exists there. Does the, does the geography help protect it? So example is the title of Potomac in the middle of DC. I mean, when you go off past the boat ramp, you have to drive past a shopping cart and a couple of dead bodies. Like it's, it's crazy crowded, but the new, it almost like because of its geography, it'll help insulate it from fishing pressure. Is that, is that too far off? Well, I don't think so. No. And I mean, it's still, there's still large, vast chunks of private property that protect the new. So, you know, um, although there is, uh, you know, what I would consider to be, a good amount of access to the new, um, you know, good, good public access, um, but some private, some, and some state, um, it's, it runs through big chunks of private land. Um, some of it is, you know, also captured within new river state park. And then you've got, you know, both sides, both river sides of Plater Lake as well. Uh, and there's a state park there as well. So, Aside from protected land, a lot of it is private and, and that helps. And, you know, this part of the state, unlike Northern Virginia and, and, you know, places east into, you know, Lynchburg, Richmond and beyond where it's um, we just don't have the dense population centers where I mean, you have Virginia Tech University, obviously, which, you know, Blacksburg is a growing you know, area, but even still doesn't hold a candle to Richmond, Charlottesville, places like that, size-wise, sprawl-wise. You know, it's one big chunk of development and then surrounded by a lot of national forests and a lot of private land. And I think that's probably, like, it, it, it's also a testament to some of our other fisheries, too, that coming from Richmond, D.C., Virginia Beach, where, you know, Lynchburg, Charlottesville, wherever else, that – you know, it's a lot easier to hit the upper James or the middle James, um, which are, you know, famous smallmouth and and musky fisheries, musky particularly on the upper part of the James. But, um, yeah, I mean that there's a little there's access a little quicker. Um, but uh, but, yeah, I think it is it is just a little out of reach. So it keeps people from that day to day recreation. But we don't normally find that it's super hard uh, with clients to 
you know, tell them like, Hey, look, you know, this, the smallmouth fishing on the new is, is, uh, really good right now. And, um, you know, it's worth the extra drive. Um, but I definitely think we probably see a little more recreation on the James. I mean, maybe Josh would disagree, but especially now as the weather's getting really nice. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, there over the years, I would say in the last eight years, especially seven to eight years, um, there's definitely been somewhat of a shift um and you know <clears throat> there's there's certain spots on the new river that are just you know saturated with recreational boaters in the summer but those places are perfectly designed for recreational boating and there's private industry that capitalizes on it so um outside of you know kayakers most of whom are not serious anglers um you know the competition is um, easily spread out amongst the New River. Uh, we we have about 135 miles of the New River in the wow. state of, so about 40 percent of the entire system is in this state. A little less than 40 percent, actually. But um, you know, and in the high country, you're weaving in and out of Virginia, and North Carolina, a couple times up there. Um, and you know that 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 part of the river kind of feeds, if you will, a whole nother market. Um, you know, we do not go that high anymore. Um, in my past, there were times where I did, um, with another company that I was, you know, part owner and a part of, but now we kind of, you know, we're, we're sticking to, you know, in and around the Claytor Lake area and below for the most part, um, is where we're through most of our work. And then certain areas of that we pretty much avoid altogether for one reason or another. And, and I think this will be good for people at people at home. Uh, let me pull this up here just to make sure that we're all on the same page because it is a very unique fishery. So when you say up and down, back and forth, and I know I'm dyslexic, so I need a map here because it is a little different. So Clater Lake, the dam is facing towards 81, and it flows under 81. It goes towards West Virginia. So That's when you say the Clater Lake – oh, you go ahead. No, I, go ahead. I was just saying, yeah, that's correct. It flows under under Interstate 81 heading north. So then your area that you were talking about was below the dam or above the dam? Um, that you operate generally? B both. Uh, oh, okay, cool. But we only go so far. I, you know, uh, there were times where I, you know, worked in the Grayson Highlands and, you know, that area. Um, would touch into North Carolina, uh, but now I, I don't really go that far. Um, mainly, you know, in the vicinity of Clater, up and down and, and, and lower, and that's pretty much, you know, where we're operating commercially. But there's tons of, you know, there's tons of water upstream of Clater Lake that's, you know, ripe for, you know, recreational use up there. And so upstream, guys, of Clater Lake would be the headwaters, which is, remember, guys, it flows from North Carolina towards West Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. So it can be a little, uh, it's a little disorientating at first, but that way you kind of understand as we talk through this, like how this river, river travels. And it's it's really beautiful. I mean, that that's really, really cool. And so just to make sure everyone at home understands that, because it is such a unique fishery. And I believe it also is like a lot of class rapids too, right? It's not like the Shenandoah where you could basically swim the thing and not die. Like there's some sketchy part, parts in it, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so basically, you know, this river starts generally outside of Boone, North Carolina runs into the high country or through the high country through, you know, through outside of Boone, through Ash County, North Carolina, and then enters into the Grayson Highlands and like the independence, Virginia area. Um, and then the terrain, to be honest, you know, from the Independence area down to, um, say, you know, Falls Falls is very diverse. I mean, you've got high rock cliffs and stuff and some of that up there, not quite as much as below the dam, below Clater, but um, a lot of farm, a lot of private property, a lot of protected property up there. Um a lot of different kind of tributaries coming in. You have stock trout streams, native trout streams. There's all kinds of stuff feeding that whole corridor up there. And then, you know, once you get into 
you know, below the lake, you know, through Radford and everything, then, you know, and into Giles, then, you know, some of the most, you know, famous scenery, of course, is down that mm-hmm. way, Palisades and, you know, all the rock escarpments and stuff that you, they can be seen from the river. It's, you know, th- there's been a million pictures of it. It's a gorgeous place, um, you know, I, I think, which is also one of the, um, you know, one of the perks to, to fishing it. It's, you know, aside from the fisheries, it's a gorgeous place to float. And that the, the new is really clean. It's really clear. It's, it's a pretty experience. Uh, you know, it's visually stimulating as well as, you know, the fishing is, you know, typically pretty good. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, how did you guys get started in this? It's such a unique place to say, like, I want to open up shop at the end of the world. And now granted you live close to it, but like, how, how did this whole thing start? So, um, I, I started in this area, um, as a, um, I actually started out as a striper guide and, um, really? Yeah. On Smith mountain Lake. And, um, have done a bunch of different things since then, but since the early, I have been operating as a fishing guide in one capacity or another, um, at least seasonally here out of Roanoke, uh, which is my hometown, my home state, um, <clears throat> since the early two thousands. So Austin and I, um, uh, I'd owned another business and sold it, uh, one which is still operating today. A uh, longtime personal friend of mine is a conventional tackle, uh, you know, fishing guide service here, operates on the same rivers we do. <clears throat> but Austin and I met guiding in Alaska. And, you know, I'll let Austin, you know, tell you his, his backstory. But um, I had uh, essentially taken a few, not really taken them off, but um, <clears throat> was really just guiding my season in Alaska and doing uh, kind of choice and select musky guide work here. And then, um, I had traveled and done some other stuff in other States. And then, uh, Austin and I met guiding in Alaska, um, actually ran, uh, one leg of the, uh, road crew for the fly fishing film tour together. Uh, made That's sure, freaking awesome. made sure that we could, uh, you know, uh, live with each other and, uh, be, <laughs> quote unquote, married to one another in this outfit. And, you know, basically here we are, Uh, you know, the stuff Austin grew up doing is essentially and where is essentially a mirror image of what we do here. Um, So it's, it it wasn't like it was a stretch. He's also been in Virginia for, you know, the last long period of time. So this is essentially, uh, we're just basically channeling what we've done, uh, you know, as, you know, children and young men and young adults growing up in this and, um, you know, applied it, you know, in a, in a professional setting. Um, but so yeah, there's so. definitely a story there. I need to know how a boy from Roanoke decides, like, I want to go fight grizzly bears in Alaska and fly. Like, how does that, how did that happen? That's uh, so yeah, cool. It's super simple, man. It's, it's, uh, it's money. <laughs> no, well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, that's just the long and the short of, um, it's just kind of one of those deals, man, where it was just, uh, it was an, it's an easy step to take once you're already in the business. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. so you already know people most likely who are doing it, it, which is in my case is exactly, you know, how it was. I I knew other guys that were working in Alaska and, you know, it, it was quite an easy step to be honest. And, you know, there's a lot of places in Alaska. I, and I, I'm an, an advocate for it for young guys starting out, you know, I mean, I, I've, and Austin has too. I mean, some of our, our better friends and some of the some of the best guys I know um, started out up there in their, you know, late teens, you know, just, you know, barely old enough to, you know, to vote and, um, you know, turn themselves into, you know, well-seasoned, well-equipped fishing guys, people that, you know, you know, are, are really good at what they do and sound and, uh, you know, on the leading edge of, you know, the industry, in my opinion. It's That's a great so place. crazy to me, though, because, like, I've had so many people on this show, Alex, who's with the DWR, uh, the individual who runs the James River Fishing Report website. There's so many people that guided, like, fly fished out that way. And it's so crazy, like, how that creates, like, a harder angler when you're out there. 
doing that. Did, did you striper fish and then make the transition to fly or did you always have a background in fly? No, I had a background in it already. Um, you, you know, and I did, you know, as pr from a, a guiding perspective when I was doing that, it was, you know, it was, it was every, it was the whole gamut, you know, it was everything from fly fishing, light tackle to, you know, fishing live bait under planer boards, you know, the proper bait seasonally, all, you know, all the things, um, okay. you know, the Smith Mountain Lake is obviously has a huge, you know, there's a, there's a guiding tourism business down there where people are going out, getting their fish, keeping their legal creel limit, doing the fish fry with the folks, you know, the whole nine yards. I mean, that, that's still alive and well down there. Um, and it, Honestly, it employs a lot of, you know, a lot of dudes. There's a lot of good guys down there uh, still to this day. A lot of them been at it for a long time, like guys that I, you know, I have a lot of respect for. And Austin and I were just talking about this earlier today. And, um, yeah, if if you're into that, it's a great thing to do. It's still, uh, you know, it's a put and take fishery. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a good time. You know, if somebody's into that, yeah, I mean, they're still alive and well there. Uh, Austin, how did you then? How does your story dovetail into this? Did you guys you met met in Alaska, correct? Yeah, so we met in Alaska a few years ago. Um, I'll be honest, I, I you know I knew who Josh was prior to going up to Alaska. Um, you know he's been a muskie and and bass and trout guide in in the western part of Virginia and southwestern part of the state and West Virginia a little bit seasonally and all these places. Um, you know, so I had an awareness of who he was. Um, we didn't know each other prior, but I grew up in Southern West Virginia. So I actually grew up in Oak Hill, West Virginia, um, fishing, you know, and, and recreating on, on that part of the new river, you know, and other smaller rivers in that area. Um, and so, you know, I went to college, worked at a fly shop called TCO fly shop in state college when I was at Penn state. Um, and that really kind of, you know, propelled my interest in this, you know, industry, you know, and probably to my parents chagrin, um, not using my, my degree, um, and just, uh, <laughs> to become a fishing guide. And, and so when, you know, Josh and I met, you know, I had, um, I had done like a little bit in Virginia, um, you know, really just some people, you know, word of mouth people, people I had known from PA and all those, all those things. And, I basically kind of just approached him a little bit out of respect. And I was like, Hey man, like, you know, don't really want to step on your toes, like blah, blah, blah. And we kind of just, you know, maybe over some drinks and whatnot, we were like, look, man, I think we can actually, you know, give this thing a really good go. And what I think Josh and I bring to the table is that we, you know, offer a, a unique experience for musky anglers in, in the Western part of the state between the James and the new, um, that it is done on the fly, um, which traditionally you will see it's done on conventional gear. Um, and so, you know, learning from Josh, um, was, was, was super huge for me. You know, he shortened a, a whole lot of my learning curve, things that little nuanced things that I didn't really know. So, um, yeah, it was one of those things where it just kind of, it kind of spiraled out of our, you know, relationship up in, in Alaska, working together there. Um, and we just, like he said, we kind of just, uh, you know, there may be a little bit of difference in our age, but I think we're kindred spirits in a lot of ways, um, you know, and get along super well. I mean, I, at this point, you know, I probably talk to Josh more than, than anybody I know. And, um, you know, just, we're constantly trying to grow and evolve and do these things. But, um, you know, we basically wanted to offer, and I think Josh was doing this prior to me, don't get me wrong. Um, we wanted to offer the best fly fishing experience for musky, in the state of Virginia. Um, and then, you know, it, it as well as smallmouth bass, wild trout and, and beyond. So. So did, did, did you guys have a background in fishing for muskie or did you sharpen your, your skills for that with like pike in Alaska and Canada, or, or was there somewhere else that helped you hone that craft and then you took it here? Or did you just, like I said, always have the background in muskie? No, I caught muskie in Virginia long before catching pike in Alaska uh, and or Canada, which I, I've done, obviously I've done it in Alaska and I, I have done it personally in Canada as well. Um, no, so in the new, you know, the, the state stocked those fish in 1967. That was the first year they did it. So, um, you know, that was, you know, 
more than five and less than 10 years before I was born. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you know, they've been in the state, you know, longer than I have. So they've always been around, right? That I think, I think the, what it said, I think they originally put like 500 of them in the new when they did it in 67, purely for a game fish, you know, it was a, a fish that was added. They felt it would work. And sure enough, they were right. It's been, you know, quite the success story. Um, you know, I can't sit, I can't, you know, we've seen the numbers. We have it on paper. I can't spit what those numbers are, um, you know, kind of per, per mile kind of numbers. It's, More than one, less than a million. Yeah. <laughs> yes. it's, uh, <laughs> it, as far as muskie fisheries goes, population is, is, is pretty good. It's pretty dense. Um, you know, there's excellent opportunity there, but yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, I grew up fishing these rivers, uh, and the lake. So, um, and, and a lot of the stuff around here, you know, um, everything from kind of blue line trout streams to, you know, um, Smith mountain Lake and even as, you know, in Chesapeake Bay. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, most of the information I had about muskie, you know, was learned, uh, prior to anything to do with any kind of pike in Alaska. But, and, to, and quite frankly, you know, I, what we do in Alaska is, um, you, you know, we're on, we, we basically got on the number one trout river in the state of Alaska. So, you know, wow. pike is usually, you know, pretty far from our clients' minds up there. <laughs> yeah. We, we probably actually do less pike than anything else up there. And really? it's, yeah, I mean, just where yeah. we are, there, there are certainly better pike fisheries, um, in Alaska, you know, the Yukon drainage and things like that than where we are. Um, so pike is kind of like a additional fun thing throughout the week. Like if somebody wants to catch an, adi you know, their 12th species or whatever that week. Um, and we fish the sloughs more often than the lake. So you're, you're typically catching a lot more hammer handles. Although we've seen some very large pike come out of a, a, a pond, essentially, uh, up there, but it's, it's typically out in the lake is where you catch a lot of the 40 plus inch fish. Alaska's just got to spoil you guys rotten when you go up there compared to <laughs> yes. fishing around here. That's just so freaking awesome. It definitely uh, does. Um, just to give people a little context. So musky fishing, you know, again, I could be wrong here, but it was really introduced. The new river was, was the first born child of the whole Virginia musky thing. And then I guess in recent years, because of social media and everything, the James became the hot girl at the bar. Um, how long, like, did you guys first, w when you guys came up with this plan, was it just to focus on the new and then the James started to get hot or was it both rivers at the same time? No, I, it's always for me. Um, it's, you know, being in Roanoke, you're, you're equal distance between the two. Uh, that's an A and that's part of the, the blessing of being here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the new typically will is a little more resilient to blowing out, you know, below Claytor Lake, you know, than the upper James. So it offers a lot of flexibility when you have traveling clientele, which is great. Um, before the James, you know, went live and, you know, yeah. is as busy as what it is now, you know, it, it, vastly different i mean i mean vastly different than i mean just really starting in probably about you know 2012 2013 you know is kind of the you know when it really started taking off in the industry i, I, I would say you know both you know i mean like like heavy and mm -hmm. um it, it was still a pretty slow change you know but those gears were turning um, you know, there was, um, more, more publicity, um, some brought on by the gods, you know, myself included, you know, it's a double-edged sword in this business. It always will be, um, you're, you know, with promoting yourself and the quality of fisheries in which you work, you spread the word, you know, it's public land, it's public water, you know, that's, that discussion has, you know, been beat to death. Um, it is what it is. It's our job as guys to work around any type of fishing pressure that comes along. That's, you, you know, that you assume that responsibility as soon as you start taking people fishing on public waterways. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's whatever it is, what it is. Um, I, you know, 
I guess we're, you know, the best way to look at it, I guess, just chalk it up is, hey, I mean, at least we're we're lucky that we have this kind of this kind of mileage of river and this kind of access to be able to, you know, play the game and, you know, try to put your yourself and your clients in the best position possible. But the new is also a lot bigger than the upper James and there's really? more of it. So, you know, it's there's that I, I arguably I, I would say from a fishing musky the James is easier, you know, it's easier to learn how the fish move and, you know, where they live seasonally. It's far easier on the James than the new river because of the size and the diversity of habitat over a larger scale on the new, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, they're more to dialing in exactly where fish live seasonally on a larger river obviously it makes perfect sense but um yeah the james is far more you know like when you stand back and just look at it you're like oh okay well you know i need to fish here you know where the other one you can look at it and be like oh man here 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 you know it's like it's it's a little more um it's just a little more of an undertaking to learn i would say if you were starting at you know at a baseline, you know, and, and trying to figure it out. I think the James is a little easier, smaller, yeah, similar numbers of density packed into smaller places. You know, it makes sense. The way you say that makes so much sense because it really reminds me, you know, my native waters are like the north and south fork of the Shenandoah. And and that is really small and confined areas. And I know like, you know, they're trying to get musky to get in there. And now it kind of makes sense in my mind. It's like, that's kind of like the James. You got these small areas with very like no duh, that's where they're going to be at. And, and, you know, looking at guys, I also have a map up here just to kind of get my bearings. Like, yeah, the new is freaking, it's massive, but it's so weird. Like it is bigger, but why the hell is it? No one knows about this thing. It's like right there, but it is so shielded and protected because I think of its geography compared to big cities. And, and just to add, Josh, what you said, I think it's also like you get a fishery that's close to Richmond. Guess what? You're a CEO of a company. You can just cap off for the weekend and you can hit the James. It's right there. I mean, there is easy convenience associated with it as well, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, we actually, you know, we've added a an additional guide, uh, partly because we need somebody here in the summer because you know I, I leave next friday so i'm out of here soon so um we have a need for it here because of the smallmouth fishing here locally on you know and we're developing programs in other places to better serve those very people who are on the outskirts and may think it's too far to come to the new um you know I don't think that's the case. I, I mean, I, I would travel to the new from, I mean, we get people that travel from all over Pennsylvania, West Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, you know, wow. Wow. As they come out from out West even. So, you know, it's, they're well known. Um, you, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, one of the biggest names in the musky industry is from right here and, you know, has, you know, made his bones on these very rivers in which we talk about. So, you know, the secret's out. It's been, it has been for years. You know, it's never, you know, in a perfect world with, you know, if if I was the only guy, Austin and I were the only guys guiding on the new and the James, and, you know, man, wouldn't that be sweet? But <laughs> I'm also a realist, and, you know, it, it's uh, that's the beauty of, of where we are and, and – the kind of society we have, you know, you can throw your computer away and, you know, set down your skill saw or whatever the case is and go to work as a fishing guide. If you got the skills and the people skills to do so, and you know, it, it's your, it's your right to do it. So, you, you know, would it be nice to have less pressure when you're out there working? Of course. I mean, who wouldn't say that, but you know, this is public water, public access, you know, bring it on. You know, we just have to be better. You know, that's, that's how we have to look at it. And I think the big thing too, like to add to what you're saying, like compared to like, you know, you would compare the James more so to like the South Fork of the Shenandoah, you know, as far as size goes, um, you know, and then what he was talking about is like, sure. So the, the new, there's a ton of river miles, right. 
comparatively speaking. I mean, the James, there's there's a hell of a lot of river miles as well. Um, but, you know, a lot of our rain stops at a certain point uh, on the James that we, we just mm-hmm. don't fly below a certain point on the James. The new, I feel like we cover a little bit more river miles. I've never really put a ton of thought to it, but I, I would stretch to say we do. However, what he's saying too, or to what add to what he was saying earlier is you look at the new – and you know there's there's well there's there's musky pools that you could spend eight hours in you that they're on the left side they're on the right side they're in the middle and it's two to three times wider than the james in some of the musky pools that we fish up there um and so it's just you know it's um the new it offers just something a little different and and i don't necessarily think that the fish get bigger on the new or they're any smaller or any of that um it's just a different kind of experience from a a fishing perspective where you know the new is just it's a much larger river and i think that's cool you know it's um it certainly presents its uh obstacles with uh fly fishing for them but you'll see guys and uh, josh would tell you this too like especially gear guys for muskie they'll go down the middle of the river and they'll just they'll set the trolling motor down. They'll hit, it's like bombs over Baghdad. They just hit both sides. Um, you know, cause it's just, it's, it's a much larger river. Whereas on the James, you know, you're like, okay, they're sure they're on the river right bank here um, to some degree, or, you know, I've moved them out of there or whatever, but t- typically your river left here is where you want to be. Right. Or you're fishing the middle here. Um, the banks aren't as great, you know, whatever. Um, whereas the new it's, it can be a little more, you know, daunting for, um, the everyday angler. And then sometimes even as a guide where you're, you're like, I mean, you know, I could spend eight hours fishing two musky pools, you know, and, and feel like I'm still fishing them every which way, every angle. Um, and whereas you just don't quite get that experience on the James, there are spots like that. Don't get me wrong. Um, it's, it's not an absolute, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of more what he was saying, you know, um, with, with the size, it's something to consider with the new and, and, and it presents the same, you know, we, we run a lot of the same stretches for smallmouth and it presents the, the same, um, you know, advantages and, you know, kind of hurdles with smallmouth as well. I think probably the size, the width of the, you know, the new does lend to growing slightly bigger, you know, smallmouth typically, um, with some higher, you know, densities, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's the same thing where, you know, there's certain spots where you can be on both. We just ran a group trip on, you know, like Friday or Saturday. I can't remember. And I mean, you could certain stretch we did, you could, you could practically him and I could float down both sides. And I mean, you're few and far between with dead that's water um, on the new river. I, that That's just so, that's so crazy. And then guys, if you didn't know, like uh, the new river, you know, it is vaunted. I mean, musky, it, I think it still holds a state record for musky, 45 pounds. Uh, smallmouth was eight pounds, I believe, as I'm on the DWR website, just to make sure of my numbers so I don't get killed in the comment section. Eight pounds, one ounce. 47 pounds and what, 54 inches, I think it was? Yeah, yeah. Was like and 2002, I believe, is when that fish, it stood since 2002. It's pretty strong. I mean, it stood for, what, 21 years, so. Yeah. So, yeah. And then the smallmouth too was 2003, I think. But like, so the, the point is like, so there, yeah, this, this place is is a dinosaur and it's absolutely vaunted. And it's so interesting when you guys keep talking about pressure. And I hear this a lot with the musky guys. And I wonder if just Minnesota is what, if, the way Minnesota fishing is now is kind of what this place will be like in 10 years with the, with the musky pressure. And if that's kind of like the future of Virginia musky is kind of like that. If you have to visualize what the next 10 years will be like. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've been wrong on this before because, you know, in probably 2015 or so 2014, somewhere in there, I, I told a good friend of mine, and I was like, yeah, you know, wouldn't worry about it too much, man. I said, I feel like this is still more of a niche fishery and that, you know, I, I think this will kind of be one of those ebb and flow kind of kind of games, I said, where I think... Hmm. You know, it'll come and go in waves of popularity. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'd be the first to say that I was 100% wrong on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there is there is something to that. I mean, it's there, you know, we joke around that they're like, you know, hillbilly permit or, you know, the ghost <laughs> of the river where they're like, you know, it's it's a very difficult fish to catch, right? Um, tell people all the time and, and Josh and I just discussing like, you know, like, 
call it like musky metrics. You know, there's days where you go out and like you just don't even see a fish, right? And anybody who tells you otherwise on the fly would would be you know plainly lying to you. Um, but it's just one of those things where I think that people it's gained a lot of popularity in the last few years. Um, and and to Josh's point, I think it's kind of here to stay for you know a certain contingency of people, but. It, it's also one of those things we see it a lot commercially where guys will come out and, you know, they'll get one and they kind of hit this crossroads where they're like, okay, I got one. I'm done. You know, that was it. It's a bucket list fish. Yeah. Um, and then they, or they're like, okay, that one was, you know, three feet. What do you think about a 40 inch or, you know, and like, then they book, you know, other days. And so it's, it's, and then, you know, it, it kind of snowballs from there. They're like, all right, maybe three or four more inches, this, 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 like, and so there are like, you know, I think musky guys are kind of, you know, a little nuts. Um, myself and Josh probably included in that, that, you know, you put yourself through it, you know, day in, day out and hour after hour, but I don't think there's a better game species in Virginia. And I do love smallmouth bass, but I mean, it's just, um, I think that it, it dissuades a lot of people. Um, there are a lot of people who come out and whether they get one or not. Um, and I, you know, I talk to people who aren't even going on guide trips and they're like, I musky fit, you know, they're from Richmond or wherever. And they're like, you know, I spent two weeks musky. I just talked to somebody in Virginia beach. Actually, they were like, I spent two weeks, took off time from work, you know, got a canoe, didn't see a single fish in two weeks. He was like, I'm never doing that again. Hmm. You know, and it, it's just, and some of that is just, you know, knowing where they are. And some of that is just, <laughs> they're pesky. And, um, I think that it kind of, they're a really niche fish in that way, but it is growing as, as angling becomes, you know, the pressure increases or, and, you know, sometimes it's just better to look at, you know, we're having more and more people enter the sport, which is great. Um, you know, people are starting to take care of these resources a little better, whether there's pressure or not. Um, and it, at least I hope that's the case. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, it's a lot easier for the everyday angler to go out and be like, all right, I'm going to go smack some bass, you know, than it is to dedicate a lot of time to musky. And and the James is still, man, I mean, the upper James is still pretty protected from a lot of those spots. When you have places like the middle James, the South Fork of the Shenandoah, the Shenandoah, all these, the Potomac, all these systems that are, you know, that are super, you know, close to Richmond, um, maybe not Virginia Beach, but Richmond, DC, you know, places like that where, you know, it's like you said, I mean, the new is nestled as much as Josh and I think it's worth it to come out here. Um, you know, I do talk to people all the time, whether it's clients or not, that are like, that's just, man, that's far, you know, they want to do one day. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, Hey, let's just hit the James or something. And, you know, we, we find that, you know, it just depends on where they're coming from a lot of times or whether somebody dedicates a day or two or three days to, uh, to going out and fishing that, it varies, but, but yeah, it's so fascinating. And, and, and cause then so many things I just want to get to today too, to put a, put a bow on the musky side of things. I feel like you always think, you know, your, your, your kid is, is the best and the brightest. And when I say that I put it in terms of like musky fisheries and because again, with this show and stuff, I'm so, I, I don't have the ability to look outside and look in when it comes to like, well, clearly the new and James are really good context wise. Like, what fisheries outside of Virginia, like, is it like the number one, number two musky places in the world? Are they just like, okay, compared to other places outside Virginia? Like, where would they rank? Uh, I mean, I think high. I mean, I, you know, I probably, I, I mean, I have fish, other musky fisheries everywhere. And, um, but I, I think I would err more towards, uh, you know, a, a local guide in those areas making the assessment on that. Um, I. You know, I fished Tennessee multiple times. I fished, you know, in the upper Midwest warm as well. Um, you know, because like like the St. Lawrence River. If I, I wanted to compare it's hard to River, that, that. We're, that we're, I mean, do I think this is the best musky fishing in the country? No. Oh, just context, just context. Yeah. yeah. Do I think this is arguably the best musky fishing in the southeastern part of this country? There, I would. I could say yes, and I say that with a high level of certainty. Um, you know, could somebody produce scientific evidence or data that may counter that? Oh, yeah, Probably. yeah. Who knows? But in my opinion, and I've I have personally fished Virginia, Tennessee, West Virginia, North Carolina. Um, 
I, I, I think the, the new and the James is, you know, arguably the best in the Southeast. Um, but there's some, obviously there's some amazing musky fisheries in some other States. I mean, there just is. And, and some amazing musky guys, I might add, you know, mm-hmm. guys that work in those areas. There's some, there's some really cool, really talented guys in this industry that, you know, are specifically, you know, kind of in the same line of work as us. Um, some of them are my friends. Some of them I don't know. Um, some of them are more just peers of mine, but there's, uh, you know, there's an array of talented musky guys throughout the country. And, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to be in that conversation. No, yeah. It's just, just to give some context, cause like for the bass side of things, since I'm much, much better versed, you could say for smallmouth, you know, you go up to, to the St. Lawrence for largemouth, you say Gunnersville, you have comparisons to see how your fishery stacks. Yeah, so sure. it's, it's good for people that don't understand when you hear at the gas station, this is the best fishery. It's like have context of like what we're dealing with and how precious this resource is also when you can compare yeah. it to a place up in Minnesota and you can be in the same breath. Well, and the seasons coincide, which is the excellent thing, you know, is, you know, there a lot of what's going on, Minnesota, Wisconsin, those areas there, you know, they're, they're starting to heat up as our waters are warming to the point where we stop, you know, and mm. move on to something else. So it's a, uh, the seasons coincide very well, which is, you know, for musky anglers, that's a good thing. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, like just to give like some context, we won't get into like densities and, you yeah, know, yeah, no, no. Best whatever, but you know, like you, you hear certain things like just talking to DWR, you know, there's a famous musky pool on the new river that, you know, they shocked it this year. And there was, I think 72 in this musky pool. And, and sometimes the fishing would tell you that, you think there's zero, but um, just because there's a ton doesn't mean that they they eat. But it's pretty astounding to realize that there's like 72 muskies sitting in this pool. And that's a pretty big pool. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if you were to tell that to a Midwest guy, they would say like, that's crazy. Right. Because they just don't sit the same way in their rivers in, you know, certain mm. groupings like that, like they do here. Now, spawn is a different thing, but. You know, you talk to somebody in Minnesota, Wisconsin or something, and I'm sure there's, you know, times where they have those kind of those kind of numbers. But, you know, and that was pre-spawn when they when they, you know, they they came with that number. And and I think there's a certain percentage that don't get shocked with musky because I did have a conversation with DWR and they don't know what percentage evade, you know, um, there's a lot of contention about like what percentage evades shocking and whatnot too, but they are pretty efficient and pretty effective with it. Um, they've just told me that, you know, muskie are a little more squirrely than other species when it comes to being shocked and gathering data. Now, is it true? Here's a segue that there's a, a walleye that lives in the new river that like just is on steroids or something. It's like genetically different. I, I mean, my understanding is, is that, uh, based on studies and DNA, that's, I mean, it's the oldest strain of walleye in North America, I believe. Huh. That is so freaking cool. Like, I, do you guys see a lot of walleyes anecdotally on the new, or is it more a uh, unicorn? Well, so first and foremost, I will say, uh, yes, there's walleye in the new river. We do not guide for walleye. Um, there just are, anecdotally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we I mean, we just caught some the other week, you know, on, on the new river. You know, so, yeah, they're there. And I've seen some good ones. Like I, I've seen some good ones above Clater, man. In there, I've caught a few and had clients hit them. You know where they they're they're eating musky flies. That's damn. You know, Holy crap. So, you know, fish in that you know twenty four to twenty seven, twenty eight inch range. You know, I've seen personally and uh, had in my nets. Um, you know, there are. Um, you know, it's a good time. I mean, they, you know, they start heading to the spawning grounds, you know, and, you know, late winter and, um, you know, early winter, I guess we probably should say probably be more accurate. Um, and you know, they can be caught all the way through, you know, into the spring. I mean, you could be up there, uh, you know, pre-spawn bass fishing and, you know, have a decent day, uh, by catching walleye. That's so freaking cool. I mean, there's so many species, um, that, that can even take like a fly like that size. I remember when I went up with Matt Sell, 
uh, who's the DWR agent for Western Maryland, and they've been doing a huge pike stocking program at Deep Creek the past 10 years. And, you know, you're throwing these basically like these musky baits, and then you're also catching largemouth that are just massive as a bycatch. And it's so cool when you get a fishery like this that you could be stripping for a musky, but then you might catch an eight-pound smallmouth or, or God knows what else will come up. And that's just – that's such a cool fishery to have that kind of resource. Yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, it's, um, you know, on a slow musky day or whatever, I mean, you know, throw a few walleye and a couple, you know, top-notch smallies into the net and, you know – you eked out a day, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, it's, yeah, it's great. Uh, it's great working on rivers that have vast resources. Um, obviously not just for us, but for the recreating public and uh, everybody else that utilizes it. Um, it's, you know, su- you know, I, I think as people, we like success stories. It's nice seeing them in your backyard and seeing, uh, you know, a healthy system maintained both, you know, with the you know the state's intervention in, in some ways and uh, the public at large being you know more educated and you know I think this day and age uh, you know I think as a whole I think the river going public is uh, more educated and, and more sophisticated than 20 25 years ago and how they use and maintain resources in a fishery like this. Awesome. With the with the musky season here, it, it segues into, like, I guess, the smallmouth season, correct? Is that kind of how, for just generally scheduling purposes, are we getting more into just smallmouth time? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you know, our, like, prime, you know, musky season, your, your pre-spawn period, we really, you know, booked that end of November – through mid March, we we play her pretty safe um, to not butt it right up against that musky spawn. Um, and then what you find is we just kind of seamlessly transition into pre spawn smallmouth fishing, which is some of your best smallmouth fishing anywhere, whether it's in Virginia, PA, West Virginia, Tennessee, the Midwest, whatever. That's some of your best smallmouth fishing annually. Um, anywhere. So um, that's when you're catching the largest females, you're catching them when they have a little more weight on them. Um, They're really bulking up uh, ahead of that spawn. And so we kind of like really book out that like March 15th, to April 15th range that shoulders a little bit around it. Um, As you get into late April, um, they get on the beds. Um, You know, you're not really hitting them the same way you were on some of those edges and some of the water where we target them um, you know, off the banks and some of that stuff. Um, and as they move onto the banks and onto the beds, we try to avoid them, um, as much as we can and musky, smallmouth, any species, they don't all spawn at once. Right. But there's some magic numbers with, with, um, the spawn for musky and smallmouth and musky tends to be anywhere between 50 and 55 degrees. 52 is a pretty safe number. They don't like a light doesn't just go off and they all start spawning at once. Um, but they start to gear up towards that. And then, with smallmouth, it tends to be 60. Um, you know, right around there is when you start to see them move heavily on the beds, cleaning gravel, all those things. And um, but yeah, our season's kind of what's nice about Virginia is, you know, and sure, like the, there's great musky fishing to be had in September, October. Um, you know, they're post summer sitting in a little different areas than they would necessarily maybe in the winter. Um, and then you know, but we tend to do a little more trout and then um you know, it, it's kind of a shoulder season for smallmouth. Um, although, you know, we're happy to go out and musky fish September, October, you know, traditionally speaking the last few years, him and I have been in Alaska. He's been in Alaska much longer than I, but this will be the first year where I'm not going to Alaska in a few years. And, um, so that September, October presents like a really good, almost like second, um, pre-spawn fishing, hmm. you know, it, it, they're not spawning obviously, but you're targeting them a lot of the same ways they come off of those bugs a little bit. You'll still catch them on poppers and frogs all the way through October. Um, and that's all temperature based as well. But um, you start to, you know, try to bring out some of those bigger streamers, which are just, you know, jerk bait or swim bait, you know, imitations. And we do some, we do a lot more gear for smallmouth than we do musky. We don't really do a whole lot of gear fishing for musky commercially or, you know, just for fun. Um, but We do, you know, fish pre-spawn smallies depending on the client and what they want, um, you know, either on conventional tackle or on fly tackle. And, you know, it's that April or 
March 15th, April 15th tends to be your, you know, your jerk bait, you know, bite and, you know, and fish and swim baits and things like that. It's so crazy because we talk about muskie, but growing up, I saved up enough money for my 16th birthday to do a float trip. I think it was below the dam uh, for smallmouth because it was basically, if you wanted to catch a three pound plus smallmouth, it had to be the new, like that was the shit growing up to do that. What What is the smallmouth fishing like now? Because I, I feel like it's not as prominent in people's eyes, but dude, the smallmouth fishing there used to be freaking legendary back in the day. It's great. I mean, you know, I, we had a phenomenal, you know, kind of pre-spawn period and we're moving out, you know, obviously there's still a lot of fish on beds, um, some fish on beds. And, and it really depends on the system, whether you're talking about the James, the new, you know, we've been on the James, the new, you know, uh, different days this past week. And Josh and I have both noticed and talked about the difference in the water temps between the two. Um, the new is a lot colder right now than the James, as is typically, I guess, the case below Lake Quater, Quater Lake. Um, oh, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it's not, there's not going to be a huge disparity, but I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're wrapping up musky guiding here shortly, um, based on the water temps, especially on the James. Um, you know, those are, you know, everybody jokes about it. Um, same old joke that they're your business partner, right? Um, we try to take care of them. We don't really... Mm -hmm. We don't really um, want to see any damage done to that fishery um, because the lion's share of our business, you know, really is musky and then followed by smallmouth and then a little bit of trout. But, um, you know, we 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 try to respect and, and honor those systems a little bit. But the post spawn fishing for musky is kind of what you're seeing right now, which is fun. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where there it, every one of them are just a little different right now. But I, I would say. Smallmouth fishing on the new is, you know, uh, essentially as good as it's it's been in the last, you know, eight, ten years. I've seen a lot of nice fish come off the river. Uh, saw a lot of nice fish in the river on, on beds and whatnot just floating through. You know, um, we saw some good quality fish. Uh, lots of nests. You know, saw a lot of clean grass uh, in this low, clear water floating down. So, you know, looks good. Looks like it had, looks like they had a, a great year this year on the stretches of river that we've been on, um, and, and the fishing's been productive. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I mean, everybody runs into it. There's days where it's better, but you know, I I, I found myself being pleasantly surprised on some stretches early back during pre-spawn, more you know earlier in the spring, where, um, you know, I was you know, pretty excited about what I saw and, you know, what, what came over the gunnel. So it was, um, I, I think, uh, when fished properly and, um, you know, kind of what Austin was touching on, we, we try to break these seasons down into real specific weeks. Um, some of that is based on conditions. You know, we know that if we quit, you know, doing this at a certain date that we're safe, you know, based mm. on years of average temperatures um every year is a little different so um i would say so far so good on the new from what i've seen this year um and what i've seen and heard from uh other anglers and other guides that i know personally um i i, I think it's a vibrant fishery and will be for years to come and i, I still think that you know, the next, the next smallmouth record, you know, when it, that one is broken, it's probably going to come out of the new again, to be perfectly honest with you. And what's I, nice I, is we had, we had a successful spawn for the most part, you know, fingers crossed. I, I was looking at the, you know, the forecast for the next week, but we had a really successful spawn go off, you know, really few blowouts, which is what really kind of the bass fishing suffers from in the southeast and in virginia um and it seems like a lot of these nests will be viable and a lot of this spawn class will go off uh kind of with a bang and you really won't see the fruits of this you know for a decade you know as far as you know fishing for them or you know uh guiding for them or whatever and and that's small you know potatoes in the grand scheme of thing because you know the more smallmouth in there the better um and and particularly large ones um, it's just, you know, it's a thriving system. The new has been and hopefully will continue to be so. And just what Josh said, I mean, 
you know, we saw a lot of big fish come out of that system and, and saw some in there that would, you know, haunt your, your, your dreams. Uh, it's so it's so refreshing to hear that just being a Shenandoah boy and watching this place basically get raped for for 10 to 15 years with every problem imaginable and then by the time this episode drops the episode with the upper james river keeper rob out of lynchburg would have dropped and talking about the farming issues and the runoff and the james and that it's nice to hear that there's one river where it's like we don't have like a mile of issues like on top of it it's just it's doing well and that's just kind of nice to know that there's still one place that's hidden like that, 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 that will just keep producing. I mean, you know, and the James may suffer from certain things that the new doesn't, but I mean, the James is still a fantastic smallmouth fishery. Oh, yeah. yeah. Still a fantastic, you know, musky fishery, um, you know, pound for pound. I think there's better smallmouth maybe in the new. Um, a lot of people may dispute that, whatever. Um, but it's, um, I think the the proof is kind of in the pudding there, you know, and um, and the James, it you know, hopefully it'll rebound. I mean, because you know, Josh talked about it maybe twenty years ago. You know, it was it was fantastic. It was nothing to go out there and catch sixty, eighty, hundred fish and have a, a pre spawn and or or summertime and and catch a bunch of big ones during pre spawn and catch a lot of them in the summer. Whereas those days have dwindled a little bit, but you know, hopefully those things will re rebound with, uh, again, s same thing, you know, a good spawn class hopefully went off on that river. Not a lot yeah, of, well there's, there's two things that have changed on that river and that there's, there's two main influencers that have changed fishing pressure, which I don't think is the most important one. That's just what I said first. You know, these, they're not in order of what I think is most important. Fishing pressure and then, um, you know, these high water events. Because I can tell you, just as of this week, you know, there's plenty of diversity and plenty of density when it comes to ports in, in, in the James River. They're mm -hmm. all types. You have fry, you have right, right now tons of crayfish, uh, frogs, tad. I mean, you got it all. And, varying stages of their lives so you know it's not that there's not food there uh, but that's definitely not the case so you know i would say the big the biggest factor would be these high water events that we've had uh just happens to be bad timing um and you know is there, is there more fishing pressure yes is that what is depleting or causing um you, you know these 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 lulls in, in the size class and stuff of fish I mean, I, I doubt it. it. It also shows you the importance of like the supplemental stocking and the way that it was like it was taught to me was from the uh, the Texas fishing game with with because they have like a vaunted fish hatchery program. And it's like the idea is like you're just trying to make the lows not as low. Um, you're trying to help those big troughs. And, and hopefully with the DWR putting more effort into the front royal, which is south of me, uh, the fish hatchery program there because they took a huge thing from Maryland. Uh, Halliker up there did a tremendous work. Uh, Mulliken, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said Halliker. Mulliken did tremendous work up there with their smallmouth program. And if that actually catches on, and then we could figure out to where maybe we're not just buying musky, if I'm right, from North Carolina places to put in, and we had good supplemental programs in place, I think that would really help these fisheries during these high water periods. I think, Fingers yeah, I, mean, I can't imagine that it would hurt. I mean, it's... Um... You know, I, I think uh, this area, um, and, and in years past, I think it did, it had a reputation for being a destination for smallmouth angling, um, especially on the new. Um, I, I think maybe some of that excitement is maybe waning because of some of the other stuff. I mean, you know, we do have a couple of good tailwaters here, too, um, that attracts a certain, a different kind of angler, um, which, you know, we, <clears throat> we, we do that as well. But, um, I think um, um, I'd like to say that in another four to, you know, six years um, that we could reconvene and say, yeah, you know, the th things look a lot better. And, yeah, you know, these two rivers are a destination for smallmouth anglers. And, you know, the good thing is that these seasons coincide well with Midwestern bass anglers, too. You know, yeah. they, everything's a little later. So, you know, they can come down here satiate the urge on the new or the, you know or let's, since we're talking about the new come down pre-spawn fish the new go home ohio michigan and then they got a whole nother season at home to do it too so um 
I, I think that's part of what um, makes it a, makes it attractive. And you know, I, I know guys like Austin and I are you know trying to sell people on that. Hey, look, it's it's a great time to come down here. The weather is pretty good. The fishing's pretty good. You know, and you know you you get an early start on your pre-spawn bass fishing. You can come down here and you know bump a few fish in that 17 to 21 inch range. You know, hopefully when things are good. And then go home and do the same thing on your home water. And it's, you know, pretty inexpensive and pretty short trip. You know, you can do it in a car. You don't have to fly. But, um, and, I, I, and I'd like to think that, you know, the new will get back to that. I, I think in the last four or five years, smallmouth angling as a whole in the fly fishing industry has exploded. You see it in the fly tires. You see it in, you know, the stuff that you see on the Internet. Um, I, some, some of my closest personal friends, you know, are in that, you know, in that wave of these, you know, next generation of, you know, fly tires and stuff. So, um, you know, who knows what, what it holds for the new, I, I, I think though, that, um, in my lifetime for sure. And I'm in, in my professional career, I, I think we'll probably see the new river as a, kind of bubble up as a as a smallmouth destination again kind of have kind of new life you know in, in the fly fishing industry not not that it's not known and, and that it's dead now because there's, there's plenty of fly fishing going on on the new river uh both mm-hmm. with us and other guys so um but i i think that um um you know i, I think that it could uh you know probably grow a little bit more and i you know i, I think the river's healthy enough to to sustain that. And I think that's, what's nice about maybe what you're doing here with this podcast is, is creating, you know, kind of what Josh was saying is, you know, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, um, whatever may have never really been a like destination for smallmouth. You know, we're not like people aren't pining to come here, but honestly, if you ask Josh and I, I think they should be. Um, and I think if they asked you, you would say they should be, whether it's, you know, large mouth, small mouth, whatever. And, and you cover a much more diverse species um, just on the podcast than we even touch fishing. Um, but, you know, Virginia can be, and in my opinion, should be a destination. Um, is it uh, in ways? Yeah. And, you know, could it become more and more of a destination? Absolutely. And I think that we kind of just, we float under the radar a little bit, you know, oh, yeah. with smallmouth and musky compared to places like the Midwest, which if you look at it, you're like, you know, people travel, you know, in droves to places like Hayward, Wisconsin and in places like that. And then you look at like Blacksburg and Roanoke or Charlottesville or whatever. And you're like, but people aren't coming there from DC. Hard to imagine that Blacksburg is off the beaten path in comparison to Hayward, Wisconsin. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I mean, you know, it's just, I've been there. Yeah, and so it's one of those things where you know we're so close to some major metropolitan areas. Whether you're talking DC, yeah. Richmond, Virginia Beach, and then you go beyond that, Baltimore, Philly, New York, um, and then Atlanta, Charlotte, all these places, and hopefully, you know, places like Virginia, North Carolina, T- Tennessee, obviously has some with the tailwaters. Um, but you know, Maryland, West Virginia, they, these places become destinations for things other. Because look at West Virginia with rafting. I mean, I grew up okay. in the hub of Eastern rafting. Um, you know, you would never say Oak Hill, Fayetteville, West Virginia is a destination for anything other than rafting. And and I'm biased, obviously, but um, you know, it's one of those things where. If, Fayetteville, West Virginia, obviously the resource lends it to be that way. But if you look at the new down here in Virginia and even in West Virginia as well, um, you know, the resource, the smallmouth bass fishery and the musky bass or the musky fishery, um, you know, kind of comparatively speaking is, is, is just as quality as say those rapids um, in, in, you know, Southern West Virginia. Um, and it's hard to get things, but. And I 100% agree with that. And I think the one thing that's really helping shine a light now is the explosion in kayak and, and kayak tournaments, for better or worse, where people now can can get out there. I mean, I know Hobie, which is a big national tour, is coming to the New River this July, the first time ever. And yeah. that can be a double-edged sword. I think it's going to get a lot of exposure, for better or worse. Uh, the Susquehanna really got exposure when people started to take kayak tournaments there, for better or worse. Um, and I, I don't know. It, it, it's just interesting. And the other thing I think we talked about on um, – Oh, I think it was like when we we're just talking in the car it was like rafts, like there's more rafts available now um, yeah. than there ever was before. So now people are getting into that where I don't remember 
buying a decent route, an air mattress, blowing that up, but not like these legit <laughs> things that you can get. I did do that once, by the way, not don't recommend it anyway. But yeah, like, so like, that's interesting too. Um, I don't know. The industry is just constantly evolving. Yeah. And I mean, you see a lot of that, like, you know, those wrapped companies with the fishing frames. It used to be, you know, probably back in Josh's day it was just, you know, in it, for the most part, it was interest and maybe a couple other small companies, you know, in the early 2000s. And it was very hard to attain them. They were expensive, all these things, yada, yada. Oh, Nowadays, Western companies. I mean, yeah. you know, up to those Rock companies in Northwest. In Western United States. And now, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, there, there's more of it. It's more affordable. But, you, you know, at the same time, you, you know, obviously we're acutely aware of that fact because of what we do for a living and what, what we sit here and conversate about. But, you know, quite frankly, you just described every other entity and every other industry basically on the planet. You know, yeah. there's more people every day. And there's, so it's not, it's obvious there's going to be more people doing everything, including what we do. Um, so I think you're that's just kind of the natural progression of things. And, you know, like I said earlier, it's, um, you know, it's it's. Yeah, you know, it's great to see people out utilizing the resources uh, when when done correctly. And um, you know, as guides, you, uh, you you know, you can obviously have your opinion about whether you think it's good or bad. But at the end of the day, we share that with everyone, and we're fortunate. We're pretty damn fortunate in this state that we have the kind of area and the kind of rivers that we have to be able to make a living on. So, I mean, I I, I just kind of. You know, I, I look at it as, um, you know, we're all in it kind of you're We're all, we're all going to be on it together. You just got to make the best of it. And and I think the resources are are uh, strong enough to sustain it, at least in its current form, as long as everything's healthy and, um, you know, things are not too crazy out there. I, I think the New River has um, many more lifetimes of uh, good fishing and uh, good recreating for people that want to be on it J josh Austin, thank you guys like again so much for coming on and reaching out i really appreciate it and then guys if you're listening to the show right now you know th this platform is for the people that live in this area whether you, you're a pro angler a, a guy that lives on the river or if you're a guide like this platform is for you so if you want have something that you see you want to voice an opinion or something you know feel free to reach out message me you know i'll try to do this at least six nights a week if i do it seven i'll get it probably divorced so i'll try to just keep it six nights a week i'll be doing this um but is it how can people reach out to be with you to get on the boat with you i know josh you'll be shooting grizzly bears here in about three weeks so when do you come back uh so i i come back in october uh, i'm usually back by the first week but we have a full crew of of guys here running all through the summer austin will be spearheading that throughout the summer um with and, and like i say we you know we, we can accommodate group trips as well so you know essentially year round um and you know, people can contact us at virginiatrophyguides.com uh, or virginiatrophyguides at gmail.com if they want to email. Um, but, yeah, Austin and the guys will be around all summer. And, um, you know, we get started right back in October as, you know, um, a, as, a, as a whole team. And then, uh, you know, on to musky season and everything else. So, um, you know, Virginia Tro Trophy Guides – Dot com and then of course on the uh, social media stuff uh, as Virginia Trophy guides as well. Um, but yeah, this is we're here year round. We have guides in Virginia, um, you know, ready to go year round. So yeah, definitely that's the easiest way to reach us. Awesome. And then as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about today. Uh, you know, please like and subscribe to the algorithm. It really helps us out. We keep pushing this out. You know, we just broke into the top 180 podcasts in, in nationally as a regional show, which is it's just stupid that that's, that's happening right now. I didn't think this would happen when I did this. So you hit that algorithm and yeah, we'll see you next time. We might be talking a little bit longer, but we're done here. See you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. And Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.